This Mustang is the most versatile Mustang ever. You have the most usable back seats ever in a Mustang. You have the most usable trunk ever in a Mustang. You have a frunk for the first time ever in a Mustang. Here we are in one of the most polarizing cars of the year, the Mustang Mach-E GT, which makes this effectively the top of the line Mach-E, although there is a special edition version of the GT that's even above this, we'll get into that later. But I wanna start this video off with a bit of a discovery that I've had, which is that contrary to, I guess, my own personal beliefs, a lot of young people, younger people that I've been around have been a little bit appalled by this car they're like, that's not a real Mustang, it's a weird looking car, Ford should have not used the Mustang brand around this, yada, yada, yada. And some of the older people I've been around have actually been a bit more drawn to this car. They've been like, what is that? That's a Mustang. I didn't know they made an SUV of the Mustang. That looks so cool. Now, with that said, it is polarizing and uh, Ford has made sure to kind of hedge their bets and they've offered alongside this, they've brought back alongside this, the Mach 1. So Mach E, electric SUV crossover, Mach 1. It's a naturally aspirated V8 muscle car. It's a true coupe. It's the Mustang body we all know, maybe some of us love, and it comes with an optional manual transmission. It has the same power as this car, but quite a bit less torque due to not being an EV, but also, yeah, I mean, that's basically why. And I'll be honest with you, I would totally take it along with its raw feeling loud exhaust and impracticality. But if none of that sounds appealing at all to you, then you're watching the right Mustang video. So let's get onto the road. All right, so we are setting off here in the Mustang Mach-E GT. And first things first, I'm gonna throw this into unbridled, which is the most aggressive of three driving modes, you have Whisper, Engage, and Unbridled. Obviously we got some Mustang, literally some Mustang, some horse references there. But when you put the vehicle into Unbridled, which is what I'm currently in, it really wakes up. And you get this really cool uh, propulsion sound that you, I believe, cannot turn off in Unbridled, but you can turn off in other modes. And when you, it's obviously being pumped through the speakers, but you're getting this kind of exhaust note or this simulated exhaust note as I drive by a bunch of actual motorcycles with real exhaust notes. Uh, and it makes the driving experience quite a bit more exciting. Um, it sharpens that uh, accelerator pedal up quite a bit, tightens the steering up, and it just makes you want to kind of push this car the way you'd expect in an otherwise in a true muscle car. So here we're taking a turn, coming in at about 50. It's a sharp turn, we slow down a little bit. I mean, even with all seasons, it grips pretty nicely. But what really blows you away in the Mach-E is that straight line propulsion. So off this stop sign, we'll show you what I mean. All right, foot on the brake. Oh, holy cow. Oh. Whew. There's 60. So it definitely tapers off at about 40 miles an hour, but that first 30, 40 miles an hour, I mean, it literally shoots you back. And even if I slow down here to about 30 and just Oh man, that first little bit, it just really shoots you back. So you get that instantaneous EV torque. Um, it's one of the big draws of this. And you know, Mustangs typically are not, I mean, I know in recent times this has been different. Mustangs traditionally have not been the best handling cars. Um, and this actually does handle fairly well, which we'll get into as well in a little later, uh, a little later. but straight line speed is what, you know, drag racing is what Mustangs have always been great at. And this just does it so well and you could, beat almost anybody off the line. I mean, you're gonna have some even faster EVs, you're gonna have some exceptionally high performance vehicles, ICE cars um, that may be faster, but in the real world, there isn't much else that in the you know blink of an eye, just, oh my God, Jesus Christ. Yeah, it's crazy. Now, there's a mode actually called Unbridled Extend that really pushes this car to its absolute max and is only intended for track use. We're not gonna tap into that right now, but on a nice open windy road, you can certainly have some fun here in the Mach-E GT. It's quick, first of all, handles decently well, and more important than anything, it's a pretty comfy vehicle to spend some time in. It's not a true performance car, but considering it's meant to be this GT variant of the Mustang, 
it's it's pretty fun to be in here and just oh I wonder if you guys can hear that propulsion sound coming through the lav mic but it definitely is different than in whisper where steering got super light now and there's almost no sound coming through there was actually a motorcycle that drove by right as I floored it but nothing go to unbridled and mm, it sounds like a Mustang now the Mach E standard range rear wheel drive starts at just under forty three thousand dollars but that price balloons up quite a bit to just under sixty thousand dollars for a Mach E GT like this which gives you standard all-wheel drive because you have dual motors one in the front one in the back in fact you have a more aggressive motor up front than an otherwise all-wheel drive Mach-E that's not a GT, but you have the same motor in the rear. Now that's good for 480 horsepower and 600 pound-feet of torque. So this is far from a slouch by any means. Again, a very quick, sporty crossover. Um, and in a straight line, it's probably neck and neck with the fastest Mustangs out there, at least for that first 60 miles an hour. So even a GT500, I don't think is much quicker than this in a straight line to 60, of course. Beyond that, it's far faster, and in the twisties, it's far, far faster. Range-wise, you get about 270 miles of range, which is not too bad at all. Um, it's important to note that depending on how you drive, that range will far, far more quickly dissipate. So if you're gonna be flooring it and unridled, you'll be lucky to get maybe a little over 100 miles of true range, meaning actual miles you've driven. Um, that's just something to note. But if you put it into Whisper, keep a light right foot, you'll probably be able to squeeze out a decently short trip in one full charge of the Mach-E. Now, speaking of charge, this is a 91 kilowatt hour battery. And if you hook it up to a fast charger, it can go from 0% to 80% in just about an hour, which is really nice. It can actually do about 50 miles of range in just five minutes. So if you're in a rush and just need to go that little extra bit further, you can hook up to one of those fast chargers at a charging location and get that done. At home, it's definitely a, a borderline necessity that you have a level two charger that's a 240 uh, kilowatt charger because with one of those, it takes about 14 hours to go from zero to 100%, but probably only about seven or eight hours to go from zero to about 80, which is the range you wanna stay in to avoid battery degradation. If you happen to stick to a wall outlet at 120 watt, a wall outlet it's gonna take about a hundred hours to go from zero to 100 percent so very very uh, implausible for the daily use of this vehicle now i mentioned that there's an even higher version of the mach e gt and that is the performance edition that is going to give you about 34 more pound feet of torque it's going to drop that 3.8 seconds zero to 60 all the way to 3.5 seconds for when you really want to nauseate yourself and your passengers and it's going to give you so it's going to give you a mag ride suspension, which is going to be able to adjust depending on which setting you're in. It's going to give you summer performance tires over these all seasons, although they're the, they're the same 245 width, and I believe they're 225 width on the standard mach -E's. And you get a bit more aggressive seats, which actually are a lovely, lovely addition because the lateral support on these seats, especially when you start pushing it, isn't really up to par, at least not up to the this car's capabilities. I'm sure these seats are more than fine in the standard mach -E, but this... This last little bit, if you really start, you know, doing this, you start slipping out of your seat just a tiny bit, getting that lateral support is great in the Performance Edition. But otherwise, I think either the GT or the Performance Edition, I don't know if it's worth that 5,000. I'd have to drive it to really determine for myself. But what I can say is, this is a heck of a lot of car for the money. I mean, this is a really nice balance of feeling luxurious, feeling in some ways like a normal car, but also feeling quite a bit sporty. Now the only option that this particular model is missing out on is a panoramic sunroof and that's about a $1,500 option. Now usually I'm not a big fan of sunroofs because one, they let in necessary heat, two, their weight in the last place you want weight which is up top right here, you know, the highest point in your vehicle. But I'll be honest, it does feel a bit claustrophobic or cavernous in here. So I think maybe that panoramic sunroof would be a nice addition. It might give you that little bit of an open, more airy feel. Although, again, weight reduction and a black headliner, I'm always pro that myself. Unfortunately, the sloping roof line means that you get a bit less headroom in the rear than I'd like in a otherwise SUV. So uh, me at six foot two, 
leg room wise can kind of fit behind myself head room wise can kind of fit but it's not super comfortable i would not want to spend a long amount of time back though the good news is this is an ev so not very practical for a long road trip certainly not for a continuous eight or nine hours in the vehicle you're going to have to stop regardless to charge so i guess that will solve itself right now i want to get into the styling of the maki -E, but first we're going to do a tall boy test so without further ado here that is <laughs> Now that we're back from that tall boy test, I feel obligated to give you guys another 3.8 seconds here to 60 to flex this Mustang's straight line speed. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, okay. Woo! I'm telling you, it's that first 35, 40 miles an hour that really blows you away. It does start tapering off quite a bit, even around 50, 55 miles an hour. And that's, you know, to be expected with EVs because low down is where they make all their power top end is not an EV strength. That's actually where a large displacement motor, like you can find in many other Mustang models, is gonna come out on top. But it is tremendously fun, tremendously fun to floor it. Now, I said I wanna get into the looks after the tall boy test, so let's tap into what the Mach-E in general is all about and what the GT kind of adds on on top of it. So in general, like I said in the beginning of the video, the Mach-E is a bit of a polarizing vehicle, not just because it looks you know, like any kind of a little bit funky looking EV, but because they've associated the Mustang brand and some Mustang styling cues. So you get headlights that when the DRLs are on, they have that kind of downward slat, very similar to that aggressive Mustang look you're, you know, most of us are accustomed to. And the taillights are a huge dead giveaway if you didn't already notice all the Mustang badging. So you get that horse up front in the center of the grill. Uh, in the GT here, instead of having the horse, you get the GT badge. And yes, it definitely has that Mustang styling. They've done black paint kind of along the roof line to inspire you to think it's more sloping and coupe-like than it really is. But I will admit that that rear window is very sloped. And um, unfortunately that means you get less trunk space, which is a ding in the sense of an SUV, but gives you that even cooler look and almost in a strange way, coupe-like rear wheel visibility. The mirrors are all right. The rear view mirror, again, it's all right. Visibility is not this car's strongest suit, and you do have quite a bit of a blind spot back there, but I digress. It's an okay looking car. I think the side profile in the front three quarter is cool looking. It kind of has that like prancing cat look of a uh, Jaguar I-Pace. It's kind of elongated, looks sporty enough, but being a GT, you get a decently more aggressive front fascia. I'm definitely a fan of that kind of simulated grill. You have a lit up horse actually in front, although it pretty good application of being lit up. I'm not a huge fan of lit up emblems or logos up front, but it mostly looks like it's just chrome, at least during the daytime. And at night, gives you a little bit of flare. Um, lower down in that front apron, the air vents are able to, or the intakes are actually able to close, which helps make the car just look a little cleaner when it's parked. And then obviously on the road, it opens up and allows air in. Get a bit more of an aggressive fake intake on the sides, being that this is a GT. Again, all of it sharpens the front up and makes the car a bit more aggressive. Along the side, you have a bit more of an aggressive side skirt. And in the back, you have a bit of a more aggressive uh, diffuser. The wheels are unique GT design. They certainly look good. And behind them are some real nice brakes. They look like four piston calipers up front, a pretty large rotor. It looks like a decent size, uh, a pretty large uh, caliper and, and decently sized rotors. Now this car, this Mustang, this muscle car, does happen to weigh about 5,000 pounds here without the panel roof, which is not light, but it's less than the e-tron GT, which weighs in at about 57 or 5,800 pounds. Um, not the e-tron GT, the regular e-tron, the SUV, which is about 57, 5,800 pounds, but this does weigh about three, 400 pounds more than that Tesla Model Y performance. So it's pretty much in line. The good news is the weight is mostly down below where the battery packs are, um, which you can see when you open the doors, it's a pretty thick, floor you know it's heavy so it's going to understeer but it's all-wheel drive so it can do some trick torque vectoring and because the weight's low at least you're not you know you don't feel like you're tipping over per se look i like what this has to offer in the sense of being a decently affordable 
maybe the first ever electric muscle car, you know, a pony car. And yes, it's polarizing. Yes, I'd ultimately argue that they should have stayed away from the Mustang kind of brand and likeness and built something unique. Uh, I know Ford is trying to tap into the past with the Bronco and they've done so very successfully with the regular Bronco. But here, I think there was maybe room again to do something else, but because they've chosen to go with the Mustang, because I see a Mustang here in the center of the steering wheel, at least they've given it some performance, some character to match. Now, I should mention that the seats, like I said, they're comfy, they need a little more lateral support, but the overall fit and finish here for an American car is pretty nice, and I would say maybe nicer than your average Mustang for sure. So, I mean, almost 500 horsepower, 600 pound-feet of torque, zero to 60 under four seconds, a nice fit and finish, all for about 60,000 bucks. Hey, and I like that they've given you uh, a bit of a gauge cluster along with this large iPad-like screen, and that wins major points for me over the Tesla. Uh, I like just having the simple information here of my range, what you know my speed is, and if I'm using adaptive cruise control to be able to see some information regarding that as well, which brings me to my very last point. Yes, this does have, of course, standard blind spot monitoring, adaptive cruise control, lane keep assist, uh, even has kind of semi-autonomous driving, which means that if I put this into cruise control, I can you know, gauge how much it keeps up or how far it, of a distance it keeps from the car ahead of me, the lead vehicle, but it also can kind of keep you in the lane, although it keeps begging you to put your hands on the steering wheel. And look, it's unnerving to me because I'm like, wait, so at what point does it allow me to intervene if it makes a mistake versus how does it know my hands are here? It just becomes, look, personally, I like to drive a car, maybe call me young, call me naive, whatever, I like to drive. So. You know, in traffic, maybe it's nice to have that, you know, stop and start um, adaptive cruise. But aside from that, I'm not trying to have the vehicle steer for me. I've even switched off the lane keep assist altogether because it vibrates the steering wheel during some spirited driving. And that is no bueno. Again, large car play. And this car or this Mustang is the most versatile Mustang ever. You have the most usable back seats ever in a Mustang. You have the most usable trunk ever in a Mustang. You have a frunk for the first time ever in a Mustang. And on top of all of that, you can drive this in traffic, just like any other old EV with adaptive cruise and all these safety monitors. It's pretty comfy, a good sound system. Using Apple CarPlay, switch over to a bit of a sweeper, unbridled, and you can start, I mean, ripping it. This is pretty fast. Now this video would not be complete without one last super impressive unbridled launch. So let's do it. Oh my God. Oh, 60, oh, it's fun. So with that, if you guys have enjoyed the video, please, please consider subscribing. New videos are dropping every single week on Fridays. Comment down below. Let me know what you guys want to see. I'll do my best to make it happen. And as always, this is Rio. Peace out.